Today we speak to a band that's been an influence upon the death metal scene for over two decades. Get ready for obituary. I'm here with Donald Tardy and we are at the Yulu, which is a very interesting venue. And you are from obituary. How are you today? I'm doing good. How has your tour been so far? Uh, five weeks. This is the last show, so I think everybody's a bit beat up, but um, it was really fun. We had a good time. Uh, 29th shows tonight, so the, the body and wrists are a little bit sore, but uh, we're ready for one more. And where did you just come from? Where did you play last night? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> so is that what it's... Last night. Yeah. See, nobody remembers. Antwerp. Okay, well, I have no idea, <laughs> but that's very interesting because like I can imagine it because you're on a bus all the time and you're like just driving and then you just wake up and you're in another place. Exactly, and you don't really see that town and you go home and your friend and family asks, how was that town? And you say, I don't know, I saw a disgusting backstage room, so, <laughs> so it's... And you go out on tour again in May, you're going to be um, coming to, I think it's Ireland for just one show and then you go... Yeah, 2008 is already confirmed. We have um, four different trips to Europe uh, with all the festivals, the, the Wacken Fest and uh, Gods of Metal, um, lots of more. I'm not totally sure um, which ones are confirmed, but obituary.cc is the website that everybody can see the confirmed dates and, uh, and, and triple check to see where obituary is going to be. So uh, a busy year coming up for us this year. What can you distinctively remember as one of your worst tours ever? Like one that you just know just which was just bad if you think back. I don't, I don't think there's been tours that have been bad. There might have been shows that have been bad. You know, shows maybe like in Italy or something are always a nightmare for us because, um, you know, a big part of this business is trying to make some money on your merchandise to, to go home with a little money in your pocket. And then you get to a country like that where they don't respect it and, they, and the kids buy all the bootlegs and all the bootleggers just kind of, they kind of make it a, a bit of a, a, a pain in the butt for you. So um, Is it specifically Italy though? I mean, is that how you... Um uh, is that how you notice it, just from that country? Yeah. That's weird. It is. It's sad. It's sad and it's weird and bands lose lots of money going um, to those towns. And we love playing for the Italian fans. But it's, uh, they make it really tough because uh, you do lose money every time you go to that country. And um, the government doesn't care and the promoters, the local promoters that do the shows, they can't do anything about it. So, you know, you live with it, but it, it really, for me, it really does make me despise going to that place because to know that people are using your name to, in an illegal way to make more money that night than you did on your merchandise, you know, so. You guys started out in Florida. There's a lot of death metal bands that come from Florida. Why is it such a seething hotbed for death metal? I mean, what is, like, like for instance, Norway is good for black metal, but why is Florida specifically so big death metal? I don't know. I, um, I've been asked that question a thousand times in, in 18 years, but uh, I honestly, I don't know. I think, I think the reality is, is when we started, other good players started. Chuck Schuldiner, um, Morbid Angel, Deicide, they were all right around our, our area. So I think really the reality, what happened was, if you were going to be a band in Tampa, Florida, um, in the late 80s and early 90s, if you were going to survive, you had to be—you have to be pretty good, or you're just going to be considered mediocre. So I think the competition might have uh, upped the ante and truly made you become either a better songwriter or step aside for a better songwriter. So I don't think it's anything like the swamp water or eating gator tail. It's nothing like that. It's the, I, for me, I think it was that we had good bands around us, and if we wanted to stand out. We had to take it serious and write and write some um, good songs that are going to really defy our sound. So, and have you actually eaten gator tail? I have. I don't care for it, but what does it taste like? Fish. And how has the way that obituary makes music changed through the years? Has it changed a lot? Uh, it hasn't changed at all. I think that's what kept us from. That's what kept us a little different than most people is. 
um, with this album, it was just me and Trevor um, by ourselves. We wrote the whole album on our own. We don't ever know what John's going to do. We don't know anything about the lyrics or the vocals or even where he's going to sing or when he's going to sing. And we've done that since we were kids. We wrote, we write entire albums of music without really knowing what he's going to do, which I don't think you could talk to another band on the planet that does that because most bands sit down and they say, I have a cool idea, it's going to be a verse here, and then we're going to go this part, and then a little bridge, and then maybe we'll do a verse. But with us, we just we just start writing songs, and the song, like with me and Trevor, we just write music. And then if my brother has an idea, he'll say, hey, you know, play that again, or play that four more times, because I do have a cool idea, but we never truly know what he's going to do, so it makes it, <laughs> makes it interesting. And the album is called uh, Executioner's Return. Um, when Obituary first started back in the 80s, it was called Executioner, is that right? So is there like some connection with that? I don't know. I think we, when we heard these songs and we were recording them, we realized it, it did feel like old school obituary. We didn't try anything new. We weren't going to try to win new fans over by doing something new that we've never done. And we realized that it is a, it is a dirty sounding raw obituary album and um, once we all talked about it and we realized Executioner's Return was a, as an idea immediately we were all like you know what that's a cool idea why, why not do it we're on you know we're on a different record label it's a, a new beginning and why not it seems like a cool idea for this album there's an obituary best of album that's just been released through Roadrunner um, do you ever have say as what songs go on it or and why do you think it's a good album to be released the best of album? I think it's a stupid album to be released and I had no say so in fact we fought to to say don't put that out the band didn't even want it to happen we didn't even choose the songs they didn't even ask us what songs we thought were smart on there so if there's anybody that buys this record it was not us. <laughs> Your latest album I read was um it was leaked onto the internet before it was actually released. How did that affect um, the response on the album and also the sales in the beginning? Well, you're never gonna, you'll never stop that. You can only try to prevent it um, as quick as, as you could postpone it as long as you can by not delivering the album to the record label, which they don't want that ha to happen. But um, you're never gonna stop it, so you can't, uh, you can't let it bring you down too much. You know that, I guess, any, any promotion's good promotion for the album at this point, but um, I mean, the reality is, is once the, once it, the internet hit the, the world, um, all of our album sales, everybody's album sales, uh, were cut in half, probably, basically. So, um, you, you can't do anything to stop kids from getting it from the internet. You can just, uh, you can just hope that they want to support the bands they love and go and actually buy the album because that's the only thing that keeps us alive. It's the only thing that keeps us above the water, you know. And I tell everybody that, you know, the album sale is so easy for you to go, just go buy the album. It's not that much money and it supports us enough to where we can tread water. If we go underwater and we drowned, we no longer can write any more songs for you. And if we can't write a song for you, then we all lost. And the last question, if you had one band that could cover one of your songs, which band would it be and what song would it be? Whoa. Uh, I don't know, man. I've never thought that. But I mean, it, like in a dream world, I would have loved to see John Bonham maybe play one of my songs and see how he would have done it. So maybe something like Led Zeppelin make of Chopped in Half. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's great. Thanks very much for the interview and I hope you have a great show tonight and it was great talking to you. I think it was a really interesting interview. Thanks very much. Thank you.